Yes. Hello and good morning to everyone. This is the Aspen and the Southeastern Association uh, second uh, panel today. It will be on the green agenda and the challenge of sustainable transformation. My name is Viola van Kremen. I'm a member um, of the European Parliament uh, for the group Greens IFA. And I'm also a standing rapporteur for Kosovo, as well as a shadow rapporteur for the IFA negotiation, as well as for Serbia and many other things on the Western Balkan. I'm very glad and very honored to have a mainly female uh, panel today on the Green Agenda. Um, and I would like to introduce all my distinguished guests uh, for now and then give the floor, first of all, to the civil society representatives to uh, uh, present their recommendations, the policy recommendation, which I think is really worth uh, listening. But before I start uh, presenting my guests and our experts today, I would like to also announce that, welcome, that uh, questions are welcome, comments are welcome, critics are welcome. And you can either uh, use the Q&A formula, which you probably are familiar with, or you could also ask for the floor. Uh, and then we would open your microphone and you could uh, ask a oral question. So let me quickly introduce all of our speakers today here. First of all, there's Natasha Strenkovic. She is a Biodiversity and Protected Area Program um, Coordinator, Center for Environment, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And Natasha has worked at the Center for Environment on Nature Conservation in Bosnia, Herzegovina for 12 years, advocating for more and more better managed protected areas. Over the last few years, she has been coordinated and supported campaigns to defend rivers in Bosnia and Herzegovina from various threats, including hydroelectric power stations. Second in my list here is Niyad Harash. He's the Secretary General uh, in the Regional Center for Sustainable Energy Transition, also from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Niyad Harash is an energy expert. His fields of expertise include Bosnia Herzegovina as well as Western Balkan and European energy and climate change issues with strong knowledge of existing technical and legislative framework in Bosnia Herzegovina related to the EU directives. His focus are renewable energy, energy efficiency, focusing on Bosnia and Herzegovina reforming processes of energy sector according to the European experience. Third on my list here, a third representative of the civil society is Alexandra Tomacic. She is the executive director uh, for the European funds for the Balkans um, in Belgrade, Serbia. Alexandra has been the executive director uh, for the European, of the European Fund for the Balkans since 2019. Prior to her appointment to this position, she was a senior advisor with the German development agency GIZ in charge of the German-Serbian um, German -Serbian initiative for sustainable growth and employment. Previously, she has worked as a coordinator for regional initiatives and EU policies with the Serbian government's social inclusion and poverty reduction unit. Um, fourth on my list is uh, Sandra Dokic. She is the acting uh, assistant minister in the Ministry for Environment Protection of Serbia. Sandra uh, has graduated from the Faculty of Law in Belgrade uh, and in June 2015, she was appointed as secretary of uh, the Ministry of Trade, Tourism and Telecommunications. And in two, uh, August 2019, she was appointed as a Deputy Commissioner General um, of the Republican of Serbia at Expo 2020 in Dubai. Fifth on my list, and also very welcome, is Tanja Misovic, uh, Deputy Secretary General for the Regional Cooperation Council. Professor Ta Tanya uh, Misovic is the uh, deputy, sorry for this, Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council. She was head of the negotiation team for the accession of the Republic of Serbia to the European Union 
September 13 to August 19. And she is a full professor at the Faculty of Political Science in Belgrade. Thank you very much once again to all five of our speakers. And without any more ado, I would like to give the floor first to Natasha. Please, Natasha, you have the floor. Thank you. Greetings to everyone. Uh, as it has been presented, uh, I've been coordinating the working group on biodiversity and nature conservation. So I'll give you the, the information what our working group uh, concluded. Um, in general, nature conservation as a subsectoral environmental policy is not on the high priority of any Western Balkan government. Uh, being either EU candidate or potential candidate country. However, those processes uh, and events and meetings, occasions such as Berlin Summit are creating a uni unique window uh, of hope for the region, uh, its people, of course, and its nature to somehow move forward also in this uh, sectoral policy. Uh, in EU, as much as... Uh, 81% uh, of the habitats are in poor condition, uh, especially wetlands, uh, grasslands, and dune habitats are being the most endangered. In the entire Balkan uh, Peninsula, excuse me, we have uh, uh, in general biodiversity hotspot, meaning that uh, most of our habitats are still in the good condition. Uh, we have a characteristic climate, landscape, and habitats creating really unique, uh, unique habitats for various species, uh, of which many are of uh, European importance. When it comes to concrete recommendations, we, uh, as other colleagues, um, somehow uh, structured them in the three different uh, uh, segments. So one of them is uh, our recommendation for CSOs and think tanks. Uh, so I will highlight only a few of them. So one recommendation is to be involved in the development of the regional uh, biodiversity strategy that has been announced, uh, to publish a regional shadow report on the implementation of biodiversity policies and the general progress with the coordination of the Bionet Network members, which is existing uh, quite well-established network of environmental CSOs. We have many uh, national position papers, but we concluded it would be good to have uh, a regional one. A second segment uh, is related to, to Western uh, Balkan governments. Uh, so we would like to see uh, a legal obligation uh, uh, that will allow that uh, cases related to the environment and the nature are prioritized in the judicial system. This is something that is already a practice in, uh, in EU countries. And this is something where we uh, see a great potential in speeding up and, uh, and moving forward when it comes to uh, cases on the court uh, related to the environment. I would like to see a standards for companies and farmers by building a friendly food system with a focus on biodiversity because we identified agriculture as a huge threat to, to biodiversity. Uh, then to set a moratorium on hydropower plants across the Western Balkan. Uh, this has been largely discussed and concluded, I would say even years ago that hydropower plants are playing the uh, unique, uh, maybe the, the biggest isolated threat uh, that is the similar uh, across all of those countries. We would like to increase the, uh, we would like governments to increase the quality and standards for the um, environmental impact assessment and to secure obligatory involvement of relevant CSOs in its development and the monitoring of the environmental management. Um, then to increase the percentage of protected areas by 30% in accordance with the new e, uh, UN uh, post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the EU biodiversity strategy that has been adopted uh, and that will last until 2030 with the obligatory adjustment um, uh, with the, excuse me, uh, with the obligatory adjustment of the national biodiversity strategies. Uh, we would like to ensure full transposition of the habitat and birds directives into national legislation because um, 
that would solve many of the problems linked with poaching and many uh, illegal activities that are happening on the ground. Regarding EU and member states, uh, we would like to see that they recognize and support the work of national conservation CSOs and the existing regional networks. Uh, then to sanction Western Balkan governments when not responding or not giving adequate answers to, for example, burn uh, convention or, or other relevant conventions. And to create mechanisms for EU investments in the Western Balkan in order to secure that they will boost biodiversity and nature conservation and not threaten them, as unfortunately it is case in many, uh, in many examples across the region. So, yeah, that's that's it from my side. I'm really open for any questions and further discussions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice <clears throat> for picking just a few because the list is even longer. <clears throat> Sorry about that once again. Nihat, you would be the next one having the floor and uh, complete with your recommendations. Please go ahead. Nice to be here uh, with you ladies. That's first time to be <laughs> just the one male and, and a panelist. Definitely, it's uh, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So similar uh, as Natasha mentioned, we have fruitful discussion really in our working groups consist on NGOs, think tanks and other civil society organization on first forum. And we have drafted uh, approximately 50 recommendations to the Western Balkan government, the EU, plus the civil society organization, and also think tanks. And the summary I have, I think uh, the organizer already shared with all uh, participants and interested in this uh, forum. So talking about our topic, it's energy transition, green agenda for Western Balkan, mostly we see the energy transition as a development opportunity for Western Balkan countries from several reasons. There are the, uh, the money landed for this purpose and definitely in the future, this should be the opportunity for the Western Balkan, especially in coal phase out process. Uh, we saw that EU is ready to financially support the policy of energy transition or how we call it first of all, not just in EU member state, but also other countries with a specific focus on Western Balkan, of course. But for this support regarding the decarbonization of energy sector and, of course, regarding the ratification of energy community treaty, first of all. So the process of the energy transition needs to be realized by 2050. It should be urgently planned and we so see consequences for certain social groups in terms of employment and uh, yeah, sorry for my connection, I, I hope you can you can hear there was just some slight interruptions but yeah. generally i think we could follow uh, so if yeah. you want to add some more please go ahead yeah uh, just uh, regarding employment of the people in the region where the economy relies mainly on coal exploitation that's the the issue and the uh, opportunity for those people in energy transition to due to energy transition programs, financing mechanism and so on to transfer their economy to the renewables and to the decarbonization of the sector. So the decarbonization process that was one of the main conclusion must start immediately. There is no waiting time. The next decade uh, until 2030 actually is the key to the success of this generational endeavor. So the current energy transition seems to be quiet due to lack of the political will so far. And uh, for the faster energy transition, definitely the money landed for the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and in general, environmental 
production should uh, exchange the hidden subsidies in fossil fuel in Western Balkan. And in the end, uh, definitely we see this process as the opportunity for Western Balkan economies. Thank you for now. Yep, we, I hope, can touch the state aid question later on, since this is a long-standing issue. Alexandra, but now you will have the floor first. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Before I start, I would just like to add that I'm also speaking on behalf of the Balkans United for Clean Air Network. Uh, I would in particular like to thank Mrs. Dokic for being here with us because um, who has followed the agenda has seen that this panel obviously was the most difficult one because when the, um, the, the Western Balkans government representatives was a placeholder until the very end. So this shows that this obviously is a hot political issue, which let, let's look at it from a positive side, is actually a good thing. Um, the working group I was facilitating um, it deals with air pollution. Um, actually, a key question for the Western Balkans, um, but unfortunately not a key policy priority. The Western Balkans are the most polluted area of our continent. Uh, depending on the methodology you look at, but let's stick to the World Health Organization numbers, we have uh, 13,500 uh, deaths that can directly be linked to uh, air pollution every year. The 16 coal thermal power plants uh, pollute more than the 250 coal power plants of the European Union. And when we look at the health and economic costs, again, depending on the methodology, but it's minimum 6 billion euros per year. So this indeed is the most urgent issue that, that should be addressed. Um, we also uh, structured our recommendations for ourselves. This is something we are already working on. And I will here focus on the recommendations to the Western Balkans. And we even have one for the RCC, but that then for, 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 for the end. Our first recommendation basically shows, um, well, the scope of tragedy we are actually living in because we are urging the governments of the Western Balkans to start fulfilling their national and inter international obligations. Most of the Western Balkan countries have legislation in place that would allow action regarding air pollution. Um, and so, for example, there are, there are uh, laws in some countries in place, but the strategy for implementation are laid even up to six years. Uh, internationally, we see that all the countries are members of the energy community, but that uh, against four, there are even processes uh, for not uh, sticking to agreed um, national emission reduction plans, and that actually five of the six members um, do not um, fulfill the directive on large combustion plants. So um, there, there is a lot already in place which would need to be start implementing. Then we urge governments to really enable effective, substantial and structural participation of civil society and the expert community. We are all aware that the administrative capacities, especially in this field of environment, green agenda are low. Uh, knowledge is available. Um, we are in this together, start using us. I doubt that this is recognized because otherwise also the participation at this panel would not be a problem until the very latest minute. Um, the countries of the region need to start to align to air quality standards that fully reflect World Health Organization's recommendations and also latest science. Um, the governments would really need to start establishing monitoring mechanisms for public policy documents. Um, and then that's something that, that goes also, I mean, it's interconnected uh, with, with uh, Nixat's topic here. The subsidies for coal-fired power plants need to be stopped. Uh, luckily, we can say that three out of our six countries have entered the um, Powering Path Coal Alliance. But unfortunately, also two of our countries have plans to start building even new coal power plants. So the situation on the ground is rather diverse. Um, we uh, need um, 
definitely to 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 start treating air pollution as as uh, as an urgent problem not only for health but also for the uh, for the whole economy and i will finish with um something we, our working group wasn't aware of that the rcc actually already started working in that uh, regard so maybe also this is an indicator that that uh, more on, on communication can be done please include um, NGOs into the implementation of the green agenda. Um, help us create an independent monitoring mechanism and start uh, using the available knowledge that, that is in, in the region. I know that you have started already, um, but um, let's help each other that that really gets to, to, to where the knowledge and also where the goodwill is. Thank you. So Sandra, now you have the not uh, easy task uh, to comment on all three of the representatives, the different topics, biodiversity, air pollution, as well as energy transition. Please, you have more than five minutes. Just take as many as you want. You have the floor. Okay, th th thank you very much. I'm, I'm, um, I think it is really important to, to hear something like that. Uh, but you know, I, I'm not speechless. I, I, I have some some comments, and I want to to add something that uh, the government of Republic of Serbia is is fully committed uh, on Sofia Declaration and and the the, the goals we, we we need to achieve, uh, and that's why we we starting uh, to um, analyze this uh, to see what activities uh, uh, need to be done from from uh, uh, the, the whole government the the, the Line ministry, uh, because that is something what is what is really demanding. When we are talking about that, we will cover all these pillows and biodiversity and and air and and everything because uh, the the green agenda is something what is um, uh, more than Chapter Twenty Seven. Uh, and when we transpone um, some requirements, e European Union requirements um, uh, related with Chapter Twenty Seven, we will we will also uh, implement uh, some some um, uh, activities and reach the the, the goals from uh, green agenda uh, when we're talking about uh, biodiversity okay i will i will start from 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 the beginning uh, i think that uh, we uh, i suppose that you are already informed that we have adopted a nature protection program uh, and action plan for uh, the period 21 to, to 23 uh, and also the the uh, um, law on nature protection is something what is already adopted in a government session and during the, the next few months uh, it's going to be adopted also from, from the national parliament uh, and it's important to know that during these documents we will expand the eco ecological networks uh, network uh, and also uh, the ne uh, ecological network Natura 2000 uh, in a, in a, a period ahead of us will be uh, the location will be uh, identified uh, and we will be also the the part of uh, uh, ecological network Natura 2000 uh, so I think that is important maybe it's not related with our ministry because we we uh, didn't um, propose this this law but we also uh, banned the construction of mini hydro plants in a protected area and that is something what uh, um, I, I might say might say the Ministry of Energy they accepted uh accepted it and that is the part of the law so so i think that was the the, the really important step forward uh, uh on um area who, who should be protected uh from this kind of uh, activities um energy uh transition that is something what is really demanding uh we already adopted the law on climate change also some um i think four laws from from energy sector uh, and uh, we completely agree that is something that we need to, to struggle and fight in a, in a period ahead of us. Uh, that is demanding. You Nobody can um, accept that and um, think that we can do it overnight. Uh, for, for some, 
um, directives like industrial emission directive and, and for emission trading directive will certainly uh, need transitional peri period. Uh, and that is something what we are trying to, to negotiate about uh, because uh, it's normal to, to, um, to request uh, something like that. Uh, but we are already committed and a lot of activities have been done, uh, including the, the Ministry of, of Energy. Uh, because if we want to be the part of uh, European Union, that is something that is you know, no, not <laughs> negotiable, uh, but with, with transitional period. Uh, I think that uh, adopting uh, all those laws uh, are really can easily show our um, uh, attitude and uh, what we are planning to do. Uh, of course, we need to develop some, some other uh, uh, strategies uh, and Ministry of Energy and, and our ministry and uh, we have the close cooperation, we have the standing working group between those two, two ministry and uh, we are negotiating about uh, all these activities and uh, we are coordinating all this, all this process. Um, regarding regarding air pollution, you know, please, please sorry, I tried to be, to be quick because of my my limited time. Uh, air pollution. Um, let's let's first say something about uh, strategic documents. Uh, the um, uh, air quality uh, program is something what is in the process of developing. It's supported from from the the project. Uh, and till the end of this, I think the September months, we will have the draft version. Uh, and uh, um, the next the next uh, year, uh, we will adopt it uh, on a government after the, the, the whole hearing process, public hearing process, et, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, after that, we will have the um, law on, um, uh, that is air quality law uh, and air, air protection law, sorry. Uh, and it's going to be uh, after this the, this program because it need to be need to be uh, adjusted. Uh, uh, when we're talking about this um, air protection program, it's uh, it's the, the the point is to to establish the good monitoring, control, prevention, and reduction of of air pollution. Uh, but you, I just want to 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 stress it out that we already um, have had some some activities because we provided some, uh, let's say, a significant amount of money for, for the, from the state budget uh, in order to, to replace and, and the reconstruction of uh, some boiler rooms in public institution and households. Uh, and that was something what uh, the local self government, government applied for, for, for these sources. And we are, we are really proud that uh, the, the local self government Government, they needed to uh, submit some technical do documentation, and uh, it, it's it's what's not so so easy for them to develop for for you know two, two weeks uh, uh, deadline. And uh, but they uh, they did it, they succeeded. And uh, the good is that we we have the more application than provided money. That that means that they're really dedicated to uh, to change it. Uh, and uh, that is also in a process, and I think that during this year we will continue with this uh, um, this action, uh, and we will pro provide more more money for that. And uh, that is for the first step. Uh, the second also that uh, we provided money for afforestation. That is also also important. And I think the thirty eight local self government were, were interested uh, into to apply for for the sources and also the the their um, um, th their needs uh, were uh, were mu much bigger than than the, the provided uh, sources. Um, and uh, um, I think that last week we we also um, our minister uh, with minister of, of finance they um, signed the contract. Uh, uh, from that is the credit line, EBRD credit line, the, the project to, to, to switch uh, the, uh, the gas, gas heating in, a, in a, a Kragujevac. Uh, and uh, that, is, that is also a con concrete measure. So uh, I think that for, for this, let's say, uh, short period of time from uh, this new government has been established, I think that we already show what, uh, what what is our priority and with concrete action we are expecting that we will have uh, um, results of course for, for some of them we need to wait uh, more time but 
but for some of them for air quality, for example, I'm, I'm sure that for the next heating season is going to be much better situation in Serbia. That is, I'm open for, for some question here, but please be, be, be quick. Thank you, Sandra, very much for your contribution. I don't know, let me just check whether there is anything in the chat, uh, not yet, and also neither in the... I was just curious, I mean, more uh, general, so um, will the U new government, I understood you have uh, um, undertaken already some steps in terms of energy efficiency and this um, air protection law, but does it also uh, include a clear step how to phase out of coal or of fossil while I understand that you switched mainly to gas, but is there also something more to renewables? Uh, gas, is, uh, gas is something for uh, what is just transitional period. We, we are completely agree with it, but it's much better to, to, to have gas than, than something what is, uh, you know, the, the bigger pollution. Uh, so uh, the, the Ministry of Energy, uh, they, they have the plan and now we are developing some, some, some plans also uh, together with Ministry of Energy. So they're um, already, we, we already have some uh, uh, plants who switched uh, to to biogas gas. So that is something what's what's already we, we have in Serbia, uh, and I think that their uh, focus on on uh, uh, really on renewable uh, energy and uh, the, the the something what is uh, uh, more acceptable than than the gas is. So we are aware of that, but um, uh, for some reason we we thought that we want to have some some quick action and to do something, let's let's try with, with gas, but only for, for transition period. Yeah, we are aware of that. I have to unmute myself. There was one question, but I'm not so sure. Let me just, uh, is the Western, uh, but kind of the third most important biodiversity? No, that's probably not for you, that's for Natasha. Thank you then, Sandra, for your contribution, your time, and with a very short notice that you could participate and give us at least a quick uh, insight on what's going on on the executive side. Thanks very much from our side. And uh, let's now continue if uh, there is no particular question regarding uh, Sandra's contribution. May I? Sorry. Yes, please. Natasha, Sorry, please. Yola. Go ahead. Uh, I may uh, just quickly comment on the ban of the uh, hydropower plant construction in the protected areas. Uh, I'm really happy to hear. I mean, I'm following. I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but uh, following the situation in the in the entire region, and that it, those are really positive news. However, uh, percentage in general of uh, territories that are under the protection are really small. So we have only few countries that are closely meeting those. 30%, but Serbia, unfortunately, is, none of, is not uh, one of those countries. So uh, the numbers that I'm having are that uh, territory that is under protect, protection in Serbia is less than 8% in total. Maybe oh, no. it's bigger. So it's yes, it's 20% right now. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about uh, ecolog ecological network. No, I'm talking about... Uh -huh. So the ecological network okay. and uh, S, uh, Emerald and Natura 2000 are different. I don't know which ban is, is the ban following this 20 percentage of territory or the IUCN categories? Mm -hmm. uh, j j just I I'm trying to, 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 to understand you. Can, can you please give me some more information? So, it, uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if the ban on the construction of the hydropower uh -huh. plants uh, is is it um, for all the twenty percent of the territory or less. I see Alexandra saying uh, it, it's going to be in all protected areas, and also the areas will be, be the part of the ecological network. So that you means know, I, I all the, yes, 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 all the twenty yes. percentage. Yes. So yes. my comment in general is that that is still like low percentage of protected areas, and that still all the majority of the rivers are under the threat. So this is mm -hmm. this means not only the nature, but also the people, and also our analysis somehow concluded that it's not only people and the nature, but also economy. I mean, 
all of it together that is under the threat by the protect, uh, by the construction of the hydropower plants. So I would say those are great steps, but actually we need the major step. Yes, yes, yes. We, we, we need to do, to do more. Yes, we need to do, do more. We are aware of that. And uh, uh, for now, we just uh, um, show um, what we think about this, that it's needed to put to, to be protected and uh, uh, we we will continue with this and uh, we will expand it so so that is that is something what is on on our agenda okay because we know how, no matter how quick we are in protecting the nature or talking about the the damages to the nature uh, the investors are much quicker than we are and the destruction unfortunately is in this uh, in the speed that unfortunately is really not leaving us many uh, methodologies to act. So uh, yeah, that, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, that was, uh, um, uh, Gudrun Steinacker has asked in the chat, of course, Sandra is here as the representative of the Serbian government. I said of the executive, I never said of the uh, civil society. Yes, that's for sure. That was a comment from Natasha's side. Anybody else would like to raise a, another comment or questions? Question? No? Okay. Then thank you again, one, uh, once again. And um, we might come back uh, to some of the questions you have uh, raised, uh, the transition period of gas, um, as well as of the protected area, the moratorium for um, uh, for hydropower uh, plants, uh, when you are a little bit further, let's say in time, and we can see the implementation of, of those uh, legal provisions. Oh, there's Alexandra now. Yes, please take the floor. Just very briefly, because I know that Ms. Dogic has to leave. So yes. uh, as, as Serbia is late six years, six and a half years with the strategy for air pollution after the law has been adopted in 2013 and the deadline for the strategy was January 2015, are there any plans about drafting of that strategy in particular regarding um, air quality? Thank you. Yes, I, I also mentioned that the air quality program, it's going to be a program, uh, is in a, a stage of development right now to, to one project. So we will finish, uh, I think we will have the draft version uh, from the September and it's going to be adopted next year. So that is something what is in a process. Okay, so thank you. Now I think uh, you, you have. I'm so so sorry I... that I can I can stay stay here. It's really in interesting for me, but I just I just need to go in my cabinet. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and I, I I wish you really really good uh, and uh, um, um, to share the, the, the good information. And I'm really sorry that I can be uh, till the end with you. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks a lot for staying bye -bye. with us so long. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Now we switch over to Tanya. Would you mind to recommend uh, rec uh, to Comment. give us your recommendations on the uh, recommendations of the civil society, but also maybe on the responses of the Serbian government and from the uh, Regional Cooperation Council. Uh, we have also read in this recommendation that trade barriers are still in place and even more so they are increasingly uh, uh, kind of being an obstacle uh, for a further integration and, and, and things like that. So what would be your main um, take on this, please? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Von Karman, for posing that uh, those important questions. But first, uh, let me thank uh, Natasha, Niha, and Alexandra for um, introducing to all of us. Um, unfortunately, I did not have a chance to see the recommendations, and I would be very grateful. I'm speaking on behalf of RCC Radovan uh, Nikcevic, my colleague that is following also here, which will help us. Uh, something that uh, Alexandra also mentioned, and this is the 
a fresh view of the civil society in terms of the environmental protection in general, not only climate, not only chapter 27, but uh, what is uh, needed for us to go further into the green agenda uh, action plan. And uh, that is something that I would like to share with you. But let me start with something which is um, uh, also importance of uh, uh, this seminar that Aspen is organizing. Uh, and this is the educational part of uh, the whole story. Um, we just had the presentation of the Balkan barometer. You know that we are following what uh, the public opinion in the region are speaking about the very important topics. And as you can imagine, 74% of the people living in the Western Balkan are um, um, very clear about the idea that not uh, that something wrong, but uh, definitely we have a huge problem with the air, environmental protection and climate change, including air pollution and biodiversity uh, in the Western Balkans. But when you ask them, what are the main issues that the government should put the emphasis on in solving? Then the, those issues that they are observing at 74%, that uh, they are coming almost at, at the end of the list of the most important topics. So it's not only that we have to deal with the issue, but we have to educate and also explain to the people that investing into the environmental protection and climate change is not waste of money. It's actually boosting the development for the region. We are talking about the energy transition, Nihat. Energy transition means um, to stop using coal after the transitional period, uh, but uh, in the meanwhile, to transit to something else, which is the new mode of the usage of the uh, of the energy, and which actually is based on the uh, green economy, which uh, change our attitude towards the production and towards the use of the energy, and also boost research and development. So not uh, that we are losing money, quite contrary, we are now uh, transiting into the something which will boost uh, uh, much more development and uh, uh, help um, um, maybe something that we are not aware of also the issue of the migration of the highly skilled people from the region uh, in, uh, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, respect. Um, uh, that is that is uh, what uh, comes to my mind when you all three of you were speaking. Uh, something uh, that Natasha mentioned extremely important, uh, and that is uh, that we do not face or we are not aware all the time the importance of the rule of law. Uh, so. Um, the rule of law is basically always taken as the political issue. So political will for uh, um, introducing the full-fledged rule of law, that means that all of us from the region can uh, protect our rights uh, in front of the uh, independent and professional uh, court. But um, we do not observe it as something tangible, but you mentioned why uh, 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 that there are some examples uh, that the rule of law, especially in terms of speeding up the processes uh, when it comes to the protection of nature, um, when it comes to uh, the issues that you mentioned, uh, but generally speaking, why not using that for each and every of the uh, uh, capacity of building and developing, uh, developing the rule of law. So for me, it's extremely important and I am grateful that you mentioned that importance of the rule of law in terms of the uh, environmental protection. Uh, third thing, personally, even in my previous life as a head of negotiating team dealing with the chapter 27, which is overreaching um, uh, uh, chapter, I realized that actually, um, common people, my parents, will see the importance of the process of European integration um, in not in big political chapters, but actually in chapters which are dealing with the environmental protection climate change, 
when they learn how to recycle, uh, uh, which is now not the obligation. We have text, uh, test cases all around the region. So, uh, so the um, environmental protection and climate change is also extremely important as a uh, element of boosting the credibility of the European integration process from both sides, both from the European Union and the, uh, and the candidate country. And that's why I would like also uh, uh, to, um, urge uh, Viola and also her uh, friends from the European Parliament to actually introduce much more of the new methodology phasing in in some of the policies. If, if one of the European policies open for phasing in, that is the environmental protection uh, and climate change uh, for the Western Balkans. That means that um, we cannot create borders between the Western Balkans in Europe in many things. And this one is so obvious and it also can help for the development uh, uh, of the region and of the uh, building the capacity for building policies, not politics, but policies uh, in, the all, in all Western Balkans six. And let me finish with something that we are doing uh, uh, right now heavily. And this is the action plan on the implementation of the green agenda, Alexandra mentioned. Uh, uh, just few back, uh, backup uh, information. SOFIA summit of last year, leaders endorsed the uh, green agenda, um, that means carbon free uh, Western Balkans until 2050, more or less resembling or following the Green Deal for the European Union and uh, uh, 10 areas that we are working, uh, 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 working on. All of those areas that you mentioned are actually covered uh, within the uh, green agenda and we are now devising the action plan in order those uh, agreed measures not to stay only on paper but actually to have a con concrete steps to be taken with the concrete funds to be uh, um, eligible for steps to be taken and of course responsible uh, institutions among the Western Balkan uh, among the Western Balkan six. Uh, we are now in the uh, with the zero draft, we will start discussing with our partners in the region, that means other regional organization and initiatives dealing with this. We already had the discussion with the civil society organizations. I know it's always problem uh, if some of the organization is not invited, we had the open uh, invitation, but that is the first one we will uh, keep open and uh, invite uh, also all others interested. So so that is my call. Please provide us with a, a recommendation that I'm sure that we will accommodate into the draft action plan then to, dis to be discussed among the Western Balkan six uh, administration, but also the civil society in the Western Balkans. Now, very soon we are going to have the open call for uh, direct help for some of the priority areas within the green agenda. So I, we will ask for your expertise. So check the website of the uh, RCC very soon if you can provide us with your expertise in uh, um, uh, uh, mapping the situation uh, uh, in the region with the aim to present uh, the first draft, the draft of the action plan beginning of September. And again, with the aim to adopt this action plan by Western Balkan 6 uh, at the next Western Balkan EU summit, which we suppose is going to be organized in Ljubljana or in Slovenia during their, uh, uh, their presidency. This action plan, as somebody mentioned, is going to have the monitoring mechanism. And yes, 
we uh, uh, we would like to have also independent monitoring coming from the civil society, including in the in this uh, uh, mechanism or additional one that is also as a shadow type of uh, um, uh, mechanism for following. That is also a topic uh, a topic for the discussion. So bottom line, not only that we have to know what is going on and how important is the environmental protection how bad we are uh, with the issues of the air pollution uh, uh, and all other issues connected with the huge work with the, uh, in terms of the climate changes. But we also have to work in, uh, um, at our homes uh, in terms of explaining that uh, investing and changing the environmental situation in our region will bring us benefits and not costs. Uh, costs are going to exist and they are huge one, but we have to think how to um, uh, calculate properly uh, in that respect. Hoping that I was not too long. Uh, no, 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 no. It's good that you stressed in the end, uh, again, what is from your perspective important. So thanks a lot, Tanya, for this uh, research boost, technology boost, which might come out. And it is also my belief uh, of uh, uh, energy transition or transition in, in, in general. Um, that might stop migration of the highly skilled uh, people from the region. That is a big issue for all the six uh, Western Balkan states. You have mentioned and you have emphasized the rule of uh, the, the role of rule of law and the necessity uh, for keeping this uh, uphold. Uh, also, I couldn't agree more with uh, asking and calling on us to face in uh, the uh, uh, EU. Uh, protection uh, of the environmental laws uh, and, and drafting the policy. So many good points. Uh, we have one question in the Q&A, but before uh, I will read out this, maybe one of you would like to comment on uh, the remarks uh, of, of Tanya. I saw some nodding from Alexandra and uh, Natasha Nihat, who would like to take the floor first. And also, I would be curious whether one of you was kind of uh, already in this um, action plan, um, uh, was, was part of that, was included into this. And uh, uh, you criticized uh, the um, acting minister or assistant minister for being late. So is that a general approach? Would you, would you or can you say this in, in the region? I mean... I was surprised to hear that at least North Macedonia has announced that they want to phase out of coal until 2028. So I thought this is at least a small step forward, uh, but I don't know how much that might be representative uh, for the rest of the region. Alexandra or Natasha Nihat, who would like to take the floor first? Natasha, then. I can, I can, I can start. So uh, thank you, Tanya, for, for your uh, comments and, and your opinions. Um, I'm, uh, I'm fully agreeing on, on what you said that we should somehow, uh, at least what I understood from, from you, what I somehow extracted that we should uh, communicate more and align our recommendations more. Because I think in general, that we are a small group of people working on the environment across the whole region. No matter how sometimes on those kind of events, it seems that we are like representing different governmental or government and non-governmental uh, sectors or different countries or institutions, but all in total, we are really small group of people and would be great that we somehow align already um, defined recommendations. So uh, regarding the action plan, I participated on the first meeting and I sent to uh, Dragana Milausnic, who is coordinating the uh, civil society, the group. Yeah, yeah. I sent our recommendations um, already to her, but I would be happy to send all the recommendations from all the uh, different working groups uh, to you and then to other one, of course. Uh, so, and then, not only that, but to somehow continue uh, being involved in the development of the action plan, of course, then uh, following its implementation that will that will follow up, I, I hope, soon. 
Um, in general, actually, one of our recommendations to ourselves is to continue having watchdog role, uh, no matter which which process is happening. And also, we identified this action plan as a really crucial for this process because no matter what is planned, somehow we want to see the implementation of it, and then action plan is definitely uh, one step forward. Um, so yeah, that, that is my, my general comment. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree with most of what you said. Alex, thank you, Natasha. Alexander, please. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you, Tanya, uh, for, for really for this constructive and, and, and outreaching comment you made. Um, we, we in our network really have knowledgeable um, colleagues and organizations that, that, that really should be included and that could add and we will definitely uh, connect uh, them and, and share the information you, you just provided with, with them. Viola, you asked like uh, to comment on the acting um, assistant minister. Now, now she's gone. This is like the problem we face um, in the country she's representing, but also in the others that there are strategic documents, there are even laws, but that these are not being followed up or implemented. Um, when we speak about mini hydropower plants that have been mentioned, we even have a court ruling that in particular one mini hydropower plant should have been removed in Serbia. Nothing happened, so citizens organized and did it by themselves, and now they are facing charges. So the reality on the ground is a bit different than the reality being represented by, by officials, unfortunately or the reality that uh, one might expect by looking into official or strategic documents. When we speak about air pollution, concretely in the country, the uh, acting assistant minister was representing, as I mentioned also to her, the, the, the law is in, in, in place since 2013 and the strategy is late since 2015. Uh, let us remind all together, we are now in July 2021, so it's six and a half years late. Um, and this is something we, we really have to speed up on because, um, as I said, out of the 30,500 deaths in the region, almost 7,000, so half go only on Serbia. The numbers are really uh, exorbitant and um, we, we would need to see much more urgent action on, on air pollution in particular. But as everything is interconnected, um, this is only one, one part of of the of the bigger piece thank you okay thank you alexandra um we have one question nihad would you mind if we take uh, the first oral question and then you can uh, maybe come back to the answer i would like to give the floor to um helmut uh if we can yes here he is if we can unmute him or you can unmute yes. yourself. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very glad to participate the first time at this meeting because the last years I had no time to do this. And my, my central point is the following. I'm uh, very well aware about the situation in the Western Balkan countries concerning biodiversity. And um, as it is the third most important biodiversity hotspot worldwide. And together with the fantastic landscapes we have up to now there, it's the real, for me, the real basis for the future development of the Western Balkans, including working places. We have to include, of course, agriculture, tourism, all these kinds of things concerned, uh, connected with biodiversity. And therefore, for me, a key, a key question, how, to bring this most important issue on the official agenda of uh, the governments within the Berlin process in order that they discuss this. And it is necessary to create a public pressure, not only in Europe, but mainly in these countries to improve the situation because it's a, a time, it's a timetable. Uh, for example, there is the there are beautiful places and we have a lot of investments and uh, so it's 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 we have not much time to to save the places and therefore it's highly time to create the pressure and i'm convinced that if you bring it into to the public agenda of the berlin process this could be a huge step forward that's my point thanks a lot helmut uh yes we have spoken quickly with tanya's comments on the educational question but how to 
raise the public awareness in a broader society. Um, I know that Tan Natasha would like to pick up on this. Uh, please then first and after this Nihat, yes. Uh, since uh, doctor is referring to, to the region being the biodiversity hotspot, I'm somehow taking the, uh, my, this question to me. Uh, thank you for this comment and to, to this question, Dr. Helmut. Um, I think it's one million questions, so it's really uh, overarching all the, not only uh, green agenda, but all the, all the sectors. Uh, in general, I would say that the nature conservation are, um, policies are not necessarily that bad, even in the implementation phase. Uh, the nature in general, it's impacted by all other sectors, uh, meaning the construction, energy, industry, mining, agriculture, all other sectors. So it's really cross-sectoral issue. Uh, nature conservation, it's only one segment of it, but we cannot talk about the health of the nature of its people, water, air, soil, without actually targeting all those other sectoral policies and then implementation of those policies. Uh, so I would say how to put this, uh, the question was more like how to put this on the, on the agenda and to put it in, into the practice, uh, how to implement it actually. Uh, one, one way could be to increase the level of protected areas. Still, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, those areas are fully protected because across the whole region we have plans for, for example, we mentioned many times hydropower plants being, being constructed in the protected areas. So we see that even protecting, designating new protected areas are not uh, golden solution so it should be a combination of various um, yeah education definitely increasing the uh, role of inspections and how they do their job that is also because we face many illegal activities it's not only deforestation or poaching but also poisoning of wild animals uh, you know many many ir irregularities uh, but in general, I would say that increasing the level of protected areas, but also increasing the management of other areas. So introducing the practices that would be sustainable, like um, in, in agriculture or, or other sectorals, uh, would be would be good uh, good way to go. So so it's really complex. Uh, but yeah, just uh, just small comments maybe on this. So finally, Nihad, now you have the floor. I would also maybe add a half a question because we speak a lot about the ban of hydropower station, mini hydropower station, which are highly, um, let's say, disputable for sure. But I mean, if we speak about energy transition, what would be your advice to the governments? I mean. Shouldn't this be a part of uh, the energy transition in terms of renewables or as long as we do not have reliable impact assessment, environmental impact assessment, is that not a solution? How would you assess this? Thank you. First of all, I have some problems with my internet connection. I will switch off the camera, so I hope it's fine with you. Uh, talking about the relation between the NGOs, first of all, and the governmental institution, mostly NGO governmental institution uh, with, with the reasons, of course, because due to delay in uh, adopting the some low bylaws or the plans such as uh, national energy climate plans. And what was the conclusion, the recommendation for the CSIs in Western Balkan countries and also think tanks to continue to point out the non-transparent work and corrupt actions in the field of energy. Of course, what is already mentioned. Uh, the situation in the moment 
practically approach uh, to the governmental institution, but what we see as a chance to do together actually with them to become a partner. And that was one of the recommendation to COSIs. So in order to uh, send our message from the NGOs and think tanks, we should approach on a, another way as a partnership. And definitely the ministries uh, allows that we saw on the, today's meeting, the miss from ministry uh, Your question, actually, uh, what we are suggesting to use the national energy and climate plans to update the process and set the clear coal phase out date and make a plan for phasing all uh, fossil fuel, not just the coal. That's what we need actually to know the exact date of coal phase out of the region. Uh, Talking about the energy transition, definitely the hydropower plant. We should uh, most focus on solar, wind energy, energy transition. Thanks. There was at one point, unfortunately, it was interrupted when you were speaking about the hydrogen plan. So your last sentence, if you don't mind, just repeating it quickly, because I, I couldn't fully understand it. I guess all the other people in the audience neither. Well, regarding the energy transition, creation, It's not becoming yes. better, Nihad. Sorry. Sorry for that, but some troubleshoot. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's not your fault. I mean, we cannot, yeah. we have to deal with it. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Maybe, maybe you, you can type. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can uh, type it in, in the chat for everyone. Uh, I mean, just uh, maybe it's not relevant, but since this is an issue for the entire region, it would be good to have an, <clears throat> an answer or your proposal on, on, on that. So let me just check whether we have more questions. No open questions. Do we have any more raised hands? Let me just also quickly check here uh is there anybody wishing for the floor no there isn't then um i would uh, go ahead with uh, also the public awareness uh, question maybe also to tanya um uh, I mean, the public awareness is, is not an easy task. And uh, if you talk to, to governments and you see that they, I mean, make a, like a split, either we um, save jobs or we save the environment. I think, and you have made it very clear, it is the opposite. Yeah, we can only save the jobs if we, in the long run, also save the environment, if, if we save the let's say, um, the basis for uh, the living standards in the region. I mean, people leave because they see that uh, their environment is neglected. If you do not have a well-organized waste management system and just plastic is lying around, littering is all over, people do not feel comfortable. Even they participate, I mean, they are part of that system. Uh, so from your let's say more scientist or researcher point of view um, for, the, uh, for the governments to raise this public awareness, what kind of campaigns have you already started and what would be necessary to support more and maybe even for the, for the European Union, what should we um, um, imply in the uh, different agendas and in the action plans when it comes to public awareness. Yes, that is always, uh, I mean, it's easy to say we have to boost the public awareness and then uh, when the problem uh, uh, is actually is, 
you are faced with the problem how to deal with the public awareness, then you have to think and ask somebody uh, uh, which is much more skillful than I am. But I can provide with, no, I can share uh, my. Um, um, non-expert view, I'm only poor political scientist, but at some point I was struck actually uh, with the issue uh, to find out uh, and understand environmental protection, climate change, uh, the importance of it. And uh, uh, now um, dealing uh, with the topic on the regional level, which is the only level uh, for uh, uh, dealing with the regional, uh, uh, dealing with the climate change uh, and the environmental issues. Uh, it can also, now again, political scientists, it can also boost the regional cooperation. It can help boosting the regional, uh, uh, the regional cooperation. Well, um, public awareness. Uh, no, it's not only about the laws, as I think Alexandra said. It's not even about the strategies. Um, excuse me, but it's easy to prepare both laws and strategies. You can copy paste it. You can use the experience and expertise of others. The, uh, the issue is uh, a track record of the implementation, not even the implementation, but the cases, a positive results which can, you can count uh, that uh, provide a very good, uh, very good examples. And that is something that we do not have in the Western Balkans. So uh, the number of uh, uh, the number of the clean rivers, so the level of the clean rivers, uh, will be the test case uh, um, in terms of protecting the biodiversity or boosting the number uh, of those uh, uh, protected areas or raising down the percentage of the air pollution in Sarajevo during January. That would be uh, the track record of the improvements and implementation of pretty good laws that exist. There are two ways how we can boost the track record. One way is if we are aware, if we are uh, understanding the importance, if we are sober enough that we are doing this because of ourselves. Unfortunately, we cannot count on this, not on the majority of cases of all of us living in the Western Balkans. But there is another way. The another way, and that is why I put the emphasis on the rule of law. The other way is our fines, like the polluter pays. So the principle that exists uh, should be also applied for even for us um, as a citizens, uh, uh, not only the producers, but also to the people who are throwing the, uh, outside the can uh, things all around us. Of course, in much larger scale, it goes to the power plants and the usage of uh, uh, the usage of uh, coal, particularly, and that is a problem. Um, usage of coal, and that is what I know for at least Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, is a huge one. It resembles the situation that we all noticed during the last wave of enlargement back in 2004, 2007 with Poland. Uh, so we are using up to 80% of coal for uh, as an energy supply in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia. That is a huge issue. So it's not only that Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and others um, should find the answer, but also others could help. Sorry, again. Uh, no, that's great. Thanks a lot. So before I give the floor to Alexandra, while she was uh, letting me know there is something from her side in terms of raising awareness, there are a couple of questions and you might pick up one of those as well. Um, Gelusche uh, Morina asked as a, as a follow up to the public awareness, I would be curious to hear from the panelists, the geopolitical reper uh, repercussions of the Western Balkan Green Deal, bearing in mind that China in particular, but also Russia, has been investing in some of the Western Balkan countries without credible respect to environmental repercussion. This is one thing. 
and maybe also I read, will read out another question regarding agriculture. Uh, I'm Diana Kresnicki, a civil uh, society member in Kosovo. I've been listening to our speakers. There are a lot of talks uh, of using solar energy as a future. Western Balkan is dependable in agriculture. Is there a feasibility plan? What the potential threat by these solar power plants might be to the soil composition and how to prevent a degradation of the agricultural land for solar power plants. Nevertheless, Alexandra, you can pick up on the public awareness and then we head over to Natasha maybe for the agriculture question, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm representing the Balkans United for Clean Air Network. But here it's important to say that the network is one direct result of the Balkans United for Clean Air campaign. The campaign was initiated last winter. It lasted for three months and we had really tremendous success, more than we had expected. It was on air pollution because now everybody is already aware that air pollution is a problem. Everybody has the apps on their smartphones. You can, you can follow and track the, the levels of air pollution easily. But we had the feeling that people uh, don't really have the knowledge of what that actually means and where does it come from and what are the solutions. So we partnered up with um, partners in each of the countries um, the campaign was an open one. So in the end, out of our nine initial organizations that were, we were at the beginning, we ended up with more than 520 organizations that have joined us. Um, uh, it was mainly a social media uh, and traditional media campaigning because it was the winter of the pandemic. We didn't want to take the risk of any public gatherings. We focused on the different health issues, uh, deaths, um, fertility, infertility, uh, COVID and uh, air pollution, because there is data that the, that the mortality is higher um, in areas that are polluted. We focused on the monitoring and information uh, system that has to come from the governments uh, on big polluters. So, um, and, and the cross-cutting was the green agenda, the regional dimension, because air pollution is a regional problem and can only be solved regionally and also on climate change factors there. Um, as I said, we were surprised by the results. Um, the, the, the structure, I think, was uh, important. We had experts that did a re uh, experts brief that are re were really full with data and, and facts and the latest scientific research. And then we had great partners that did the um, the media and communication planning out of that. So the messages were easy to understand and the language was easy to understand also for people that are non-experts. And I think that's the, that's the success out of, out of it. So um, it, it's not really difficult to, to reach out people, especially today when you, when you have social media and we're already now thinking of how we can do uh, an additional round uh, next winter. And this, I think, will be a good model also for other topics, what we are thinking about. So um, just on the awareness raising issue, uh, a short comment out of our just recent experience. Uh, I would like to pick up one of the questions and that's the geopolitical question. Well, whoever comes and invests here um, is not coming out of the blue. So it's the national governments that have signed up to the green agenda that have signed up to EU integrations that are preparing for chapter 22, who are enabling them to not comply with environmental legal uh, obligations and, and, and rules. So it's again, we are back with the governments and it's the governments that are, that are playing, I don't know which kind of double, triple or whatever games that have different standards and that have, um, well, that, that, that give green light to, to actors that do not comply with any environmental or even logic um, obligations. So I would turn it a bit around um, in this respect. Thank you. Natasha, maybe you would comment on the agriculture and the composition of the soil question when it comes to a larger potential of solar panels, please. Yes, thank you, Viola. Uh, so I think 
we can all agree that there is no energy source that will uh, not make an impact on the environment and on the nature. We uh, talking about uh, talking on behalf of my organization, we are uh, I'm representing this biodiversity uh, part, but in general, we are strongly campaigning against coal. Uh, across the uh, across Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also strongly campaigning against hydropower plants, meaning that we are advocating for energy efficiency measures uh, for solar and for the wind. We, as a country, export electricity, and we somehow analyze the energy mix, having all these uh, having all these uh, figures in in our mind. Uh, in general, I would say that. Um, as I said, there is no energy source that is not making an impact. Uh, for example, wind can be problematic too. I'm personally ornithologist, meaning that I'm researching the birds and I'm uh, especially carefully looking at the wind energy being problematic for birds and, and, and bats when they are improper, when they are installed in a wrong, you know, ter ter territories. Uh, and the same is for the solar. It's not only on the place where they are placed, for example, on the uh, on the important agricultural land, but also the whole circle of making the solar and how what is used, which materials, wh where they are uh, coming from, where they are mined, in in which areas and in which conditions. So in general, we cannot say that solar energy is pure and that is totally clean. And I can agree on that. On agriculture, I would say that, um, that in general, we are lacking the visions of our governments and of our countries that are going into sustainable directions. So even when some sectoral policies are fine or okay or improving in some in some elements then they are not in a line with other sectoral policies uh, and really often that is the case so i would say that should be on the government to somehow structurally uh, in a long term to plan which areas will be kept for the not only organic in our views, of course, but also for in that intensive agriculture, and then which others will be for the for the solar. I'm not energy expert. I would say that definitely that should not be uh, agricultural land as such, but uh, but construction, but you know buildings uh, where the we have cases from many EU countries where actually rooftops even some can be used for for solar to maximum. Uh, we even have some really. Um, uh, progressive decisions by some towns in EU or the countries when they are saying that all rooftops should be either green or with solar. And I think in this direction, it should go like decentralized, democratized <laughs> energy sector, uh, which should mean more, more small capacities, like on the rooftops, in the, sm in the communities, uh, and not like uh, huge, huge solar, um, I don't know what is the term, solar, not plantation, solar. Power plants. Power plants, yeah, thanks, Nihat. Solar, huge solar power plants that will actually cover the, the agricultural land. Because of course, then it's not only taking the potential in agricultural sector, but actually impacting the, the uh, grassland biodiversity or, or any other. Uh, so I would say in general, what apart from all this, what we are emphasizing is the what I was also highlighted is EIA procedures, environmental impact procedures that should be uh, improved, that public participation should be strengthened and, and improved. And having this in mind, I hope that uh, controversial projects, no matter if they are from coming from dirty energy sector or from renewables, will, will would be minimized. If I can add just for yeah, the 30 exactly. seconds here. No, no, you can go for longer because I just wanted to give you exactly this question. When it comes to, let's say, public uh, buildings, uh, whether there are already initiatives, uh, exactly what Natasha has, has raised. I mean, this is very common here in Germany and many other northern European states that we start with their, let's say, local municipal buildings. We, we start with initiatives. Uh, we start with 
really being a role model then for private persons? And this would be my question to you, whether you have any uh, initiatives in that respect already in the region. And my second question, if you don't mind, uh, would be uh, the cooperation with the private sector. You have mentioned that in your recommendations as well. Uh, what exactly is needed for the region to have a, let's say, more um, on an easier cooperation with the private sector? Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on those yeah. two or three points, please. Okay, first of all, I have to add, we have a lot of agriculture abandoned land, especially in Eastern Bosnia and in general in Western Balkans due to the migration of the people. And so somehow we have to use, in my point of view, this land for the biomass or for the solar plants or whatever, we should define and use this potential due to uh, abandoned agriculture land. Talking about uh, the, the solar uh, energy in general for the producing the electricity, definitely in Western Balkan countries, it's not feasible without incentives without feeding tariffs for the moment because the electricity price is the lower in the Europe, something about five or six euro cent per kilowatt hour. There is a, a need for some financial financial support, financial mechanisms, not uh, such as feeding tariff, but uh, through the energy cooperatives or the, some energy plus also enabling Prosumer system in Western Balkans. Mostly, the actually uh, each solar power plant which has been built in Western Balkans uh, are for the feeding tariff systems, and that's very feasible. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different uh, recommendations how to solve those issues, especially in new laws here in Bosnia uh, on renewable energy sources and uh, mm, increase the solar plants for the uh, own consumption, especially in industry. And that is the point where we can talk about the cooperation with private sector, especially in industry sectors. They don't have a the time to develop projects to investigate the, the electricity and energy costs within their companies and definitely they need some support uh, in identifying the areas identifying the uh, the potentials again talking about the electricity price uh, mostly the, the private companies don't know how much money they spend on energy and even they know it's a small amount of money in total cost, for example, of production. So if uh, the electricity price stays as it, and now there is no, mm, in, in short term period, opportunity to increase those uh, technology in a private sector. And in the end, some support, some mechanisms should be <clears throat> in place in order to increase the use of renewable energy sources in private sector. So we have officially two minutes, only one minute left. Uh, okay, let me just read this. And if anybody feels uh, as if we could find an answer on this, uh, then raise your hand another question as solar panels have a limited lifespan are there plans to construct recycling plants in the region for these panels after 25 or 35 years when they have been consumed or criteria for countries to fulfill or will or we will end with major debris um, all around the region um, so maybe Nihat, this would be also your question and then I yeah. would wrap up quickly. In my top point of, of view and my experience, there is no any discussion about this issue. And definitely it's important and should be somehow discussed in the future. Well, we, when we think in a broader sense, and let me 
um, include this in the in the summary. We need for a circular economy, of course, recycling capacities. And recycling capacities cannot just be within the European Union, but must be located also and <clears throat> part of your economy, economies in the Western Balkan. And I'm sure some of the industry will be happy to build up those capacities. But of course, recycling quotas is another thing. And that's neat. I mean, I have visited one of the landfills uh, and we are at the very beginning. We have to start from the scratch when it comes to selection of waste, uh, sortation and everything also, which even in the European Union is, is, is still not at a satisfying level. So um, I guess there will be a recycling factory for solar panels, but uh, this might take a little bit of time since most of them are still in, uh, in work uh, or in function. Let me thank you all the audience, but uh, even more this guest, uh, the female guest in that respect. We had a very female uh, <clears throat> uh, focused uh, discussion when it comes to contributions from our guest here. I think we have touched a lot of points. Uh, that is still not, uh, oh, it's far away from uh, complete, but I think we could make sure uh, that uh, next to the official Berlin process, uh, the summit today, which takes place with the uh, Western Balkan governments, there is a very vibrant uh, civil society and uh, expert um, uh, uh, panel discussion around uh, environmental issues, around climate issues, and also how to include this region into the European Green Deal agenda. And many of the um, uh, points we have been discussing now, energy transition, air pollution, as well as the biodiversity and protection of uh, um, highly sensitive areas in this region will be not for the last time debated here now, that's for sure. And I hope we can at one point also meet each other in the region and not just in a digital mode, because um, it is so lovely. You have this landscape, you have unique um, hills and valleys and riverbeds. And I wish we could then <clears throat> also a study tour where we can visit, where we can see and smell uh, this great biodiversity and uh, explain to the people why it is necessary to protect and why we also as a European Union have to invest into this nature. This is what I would like to uh, look for. And thanks a lot for everyone who contributed to this great discussion. I hope to uh, see you soon and stay healthy until then. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.